Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, that humble worker bee of the kitchen, the paring knife. So a few months back, I made a Damascus steel chef's knife. Um, I had a little bit of steel left over from that billet, so I thought I'd make a couple of kitchen knives. In this video, I'll show the making of one of those knives. It's either a big ass paring knife or a small utility knife, depending on how you view the world, but it's gonna be an unusually broad blade for a paring knife, and there's a reason for that, which we'll get into later. FYI, in a few weeks, I'm going to make another paring knife by a very different method. I know you get tired of hearing it, but I love saying that there's no one right way of doing anything. So I'll be doing a sort of informal paring knife showdown. Once I've made three paring knives, different sizes, shapes, geometries, and technical approaches, I'll do another video where I take them into the kitchen and evaluate them. Alright, let's dive in. For this video, I'll be using some existing Sanmai Damascus that I made earlier. Check out my chef's knife video if you want to see how the Damascus steel was made. Alright, but let's move on to more important things. I've cut a couple of pieces out and ground the scale off on my belt grinder. Now I'm going to grind the profile of the blade. Some knife makers like to come up with a design, work that design, and then repeat that design over and over. But my method is to have a general idea of where I'm going, and then to kind of go by feel as I'm grinding. That way I never make exactly the same knife twice. I don't know if my customers value that or not, but to me it's a lot more fun, and you're always doing something new. Some knife makers have five designs and they just make them over and over. I'd just as soon work in the Chevy factory bolting doors onto the next Malibu, but to each his own. Now this stock is actually thicker than I would normally use for a paring knife. A paring knife should be able to flex a little and it should be nice and thin so that it'll be nice and sharp, but we'll have some strategies for dealing with that. Alright, so now I've got the blade profiled about where I want it. I like the feel of the thing in my hand, so I'll move on to the next step. Now I'm going to lay out the holes for the handle pins. More times than not, I'll drill the holes before profiling the knife because it's easier to secure the blade in the vise when it's still in a rectangular form. But, if you do that, you need to be pretty sure about your design or the pins could end up in screwy places and make the knife look silly. So, since on this knife I'm kind of improv my way through the design, later's better. I'll be using three 3 16th inch mosaic pins that I showed how to make in another video to secure the handle scales to the tang. I'll give you a link for that video later. I'm using a prick punch first then a regular center punch, which is the best way to lay out holes really accurately. When I first made knives, I tended to just slap the knife blank in the press and start drilling. But drill bits will wander if you use this approach, and that can be enough to make your handle pins end up in the wrong place. So, next I'm over to the drill press, where I'll drill the holes using a combination spotting drill and countersink. These stubby little drills are great for the knife maker. Again, conventional twist drills have a tendency to wander, causing your hole to be off-center, which looks bad. These little suckers are much more accurate. So you start the hole with the spotting drill, then you put in your regular twist drill and drill it all the rest of the way through. Now if this whole process I just went through seems a little burdensome, I'll show you a much quicker way of drilling accurate holes in a later video. In fact, it'll be that next paring knife video that I mentioned earlier. Now I'll go ahead and grind the bevels on the blade. Speaking of which, as I mentioned, this is an unusually broad paring knife. It's also a little thick. Now there's a connection. It's important that kitchen knives have a nice acute angle or they won't cut worth a damn. Now the stock is what it is. 
grinding up through the spine of the knife to get a blade thinner looks really bush league. So I made this blade a little broader than most paring knives. This makes the blade angle steeper, which in turn counteracts the thickness a little and improves the cutting ability. You'll notice I'm not going to grind the bevels quite to the spine yet. I'm going to finish the grinding after heat treating, so I want to be able to just kiss the top edge of the blade with the plunge line. That's that line that forms at the edge of the bevel adjacent to the tang when I do the final grind after the heat treat. All right, now I'll lay out the handle. I'm using an unusual wood from Texas called Bow Dark that was sent to me by a viewer named Joe Bauer. Thanks, brother. I've been looking forward to using this for a while. Now, according to Joe, it's incredibly durable wood. It weathers well and it resists rot. Next, I'll trim down the scales, leaving them just a hair oversized. I also profile the front surface of the scale to its final shape and texture. You always want to do that one surface right now because once the scales are mounted, you can't fiddle with it without messing up the polish on your blade. I use the holes in the tang as a drill guide for drilling the holes in the wood. Again, accuracy is important. If you don't get them all perfectly lined up with the handle scales, you just can't get the handle pins to go through properly. So. Be very careful about how you do this. I'm actually drilling a hole, then inserting a pin, and drilling the next one, assuring that nothing gets out of whack. As I said earlier, I'll show a totally different method of getting your tang holes lined up in my next paring knife video. That method will drill the whole shebang at one throw, the tang and the scales, but to do it that way requires some upfront work making a jig. More about that in the next video. Okay, time to heat treat the blade. Heat treating is the process by which the steel is brought to its proper level of hardness. Now this can be done in a variety of ways, but I'll use a heat treating oven. I'll heat the blade to about 1475. Once the knife has reached the target temperature, I'll take it out and quench it in oil. Now different kinds of steels have to be heated to different temperatures, but that's an appropriate temperature for this particular combination of steels. After it cools to a point where I can touch it, I'll quickly test it with a file to see if it's hardened. The file skates over the blade, indicating that it is in fact fully hardened. Excellent. So now I'll temper it for two one-hour cycles at 400 degrees. After heat treating, I'll clean up the tang with 320 grit sandpaper to remove the oxides that form on the steel during heat treating. Then grind the edge to its final profile. Now be careful at this point. Before heat treating, you can get the blade so hot it turns blue. But after heat treating, you'll ruin the temper of the blade if you let it overheat. And that'll make it so that the blade won't hold an edge. Now this blade is extremely thin, around six or seven thousandths of an inch, so the edge will just overheat in the blink of an eye, literally. You've got to be very careful. Now I'm using 3M Trizac belts, starting at 300 micron and working up to 65 micron. These belts are great for finish grinding because they run pretty cool, and they're also sort of forgiving in terms of the geometry. They don't tend to cut into the blade quite so badly as aluminum oxide or some other kinds of belts. Anyway, once I'm happy with the grind, I'll use sandpaper and then Scotch-Brite to achieve a smooth finish, working lengthwise down the blade. I don't waste my effort cleaning up the tang, just the part that will be visible. But I do make sure that the transition between the tang and the blade especially are nice and clean. This area right here between the blade and the tang is called the ricasso. And getting this section nice and clean is always a challenge. If you find a knife where that area is really nice and clean, well that's one of the signs of a very good knife maker. Next I'll etch the blade to bring out the Damascus pattern in the steel. This is done by immersing the blade in a very dilute solution of ferric chloride for about 20 minutes. 
Ferret is sold at electronic supply stores as a circuit board etchant. You can find out more about this steel on my chef's knife video, but basically Damascus is formed by forge welding two steels of differing chemical compositions together. Those two steel types will react differently with acids, causing a visible difference in the surface of the steel. Here's what the blade looks like after etching. I'll rinse the blade thoroughly, then polish the blade again with Scotch-Brite, removing all the oxides so that the pattern you see is exclusively formed by the differences in the surface texture of the steel, not by material on the surface which can easily be scratched off. I'm making sure to achieve a very clean surface with no visible scratches. Again, one of the differences between high quality handmade knives and production knives is the time spent on fiddly little details like this. If you're just making a knife for fun though, you don't necessarily need to spend as much time as I do making these little things perfect. Once the polishing is complete, the blade has to be treated with great care. Any scratches put on the blade once the handle scales are installed are essentially impossible to remove. I won't sell a knife that's scratched even the tiniest bit, so this part is a huge pain in the neck. Now we'll install the handle scales and pins. This is a fairly simple matter since we've already cut the scales more or less to size and drilled all the holes. I use epoxy to secure the handle. Now I'm using 5 minute epoxy which doesn't give me much working time. So I test everything out beforehand to make sure assembly goes smoothly. Incidentally, if you want absolute maximum strength, go with the longer curing epoxies like 60 minute epoxies. But if you actually look at the technical specs, the difference in strength, not that great. So as a general rule, I don't worry too much about which one I'm using. Now, as I said, I don't want to mar the blade, so normally I cover the blade with tape, but in the rush to film this, I didn't get around to it. Luckily, I don't scratch the blade and turn this thing into scrap metal. After giving the epoxy 24 hours to cure, I'll grind the handle to shape. Incidentally, when something's called 5 minute epoxy or 60 minute epoxy or whatever, that means that your working time is 5 minutes or 60 minutes. But the curing time is different. That's the time that it takes to get to full strength and that's usually about 24 hours. Notice I've got the tape on this time around. If you go straight to running a grinder belt around that blade, you'll end up with all sorts of ugly little scratches. The most important thing in grinding handles is to use a nice fresh belt so that you don't get too much heat buildup while grinding the handle pins. If you overheat those handle pins, 
you'll actually burn the epoxy and you can completely ruin that joint if you really get them super hot. Now as I get closer to the final shape, I'll use a variety of belts and attachments to get everything profiled the way I want it. Every blade I make is a little different and some shapes come out better than others. This one, eh, kind of so-so. There's some little details about the way the end of the handle kind of flows that, okay, I'll quit whining. You know, a general thing about good knife makers is that they're never satisfied and they can always find something wrong with their knives no matter how hard they work. Show me a guy who says he made a perfect knife and I'll show you a guy who doesn't set the bar very high. Finally, I'll pretty everything up with a final hand polish using thousand grit sandpaper. I don't know much about this wood, so I experiment on some scraps to find an appropriate finish. I always recommend trying different wood finishes and just seeing how they work out. As a general rule, I don't like giving working knives a hard finish, by which I mean polyurethane, lacquer, things of that nature. They tend to get scratched up and flake off over time. So oil finishes that just soak into the wood are my favorite. They don't bring out quite as much detail in the grain of the wood, but they're more durable and forgiving. So I'll give it a couple coats of tongue oil and let it dry. Then I'll polish it up. Here's the final product. I kind of dig the little handle pins. They fit the color of the wood nicely and I like how they mesh with the design. Like I said, I made a video that will show you how to make them. If you're interested, check that out here. Also, if you're interested in kitchen knives generally, check out the next video in my Pairing Knife Showdown, a knife which will be made from a very different steel known as O1. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel and check out my website, waltersorrelsblades.com, where you can find more of my work. You'll also find plenty more videos there that you can't find on YouTube with very, very detailed information about all aspects of Japanese blade making. Also, like me on Facebook at Walter Sorrell's Blades.